Venus. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you all for uh, braving the weather and being here. I'm Sandra Galea, and I have the privilege of serving as Dean of the School of Public Health at Boston University. And on behalf of the school, for those in person and those online, <coughs> welcome to today's Bicknell Lecture. Uh, before we begin, I want to thank our co-hosts, which is the Providence Boston Center for AIDS Research, CIFAR, and our colleagues at Brown University. Uh, I would like to thank the Dean's Office team, particularly Meredith Brown and Alicia Noel, whose work make today possible, so thank you, everybody. This is our um, annual Bicknell lecture, Bicknell lecture, which is one of our premier academic events of the calendar. It was endowed by Dr. William Bicknell to provide, and I quote, a periodic but regular infusion of iconoclasts and original thinkers who will bring ideas to students and faculty that stretch, upset, stimulate, and leave us with renewed energy and commitment to make a real difference in the lives of the poor and underserved. I've always liked that phrase. I wish I wrote it. Um, uh, but I particularly like the stretch, upset, stimulate, which is uh, really the goal of today. Um, as founder and chair emeritus of our global health department, Professor Bicknell helped ensure a concern for health across national borders would remain at the heart of our mission. We are truly delighted to have a chance every year to honor his memory and engage with his legacy. Today's topic, I think in particular, uh, honors the memory of, uh, of uh, Professor Bicknell and hits close to home. When I was a medical student in the early 90s, I came of age at a time when AIDS was a devastating death sentence. I did part of my training at the Wellesley Hospital in Toronto, which at the time had the second highest number of HIV patients in the country. Young people would be coming in with AIDS and dying within a few months. And today, AIDS has been transformed into a chronic disease, a disease that people live full and rich lives with within a normal lifespan. And now, we are on the cusp of something even more exciting, the possibility of ending AIDS. That we're able to even consider this possibility owes much to the work of public health, to decades of committed activism, and to people like Bill Bicknell. In conjunction with World AIDS Day, our panel today is going to explore what can be done to eradicate AIDS at a global level and the challenges we face in pursuing that goal. I will now introduce the intellectual architect of this event, Dr. Bob Horsberg. Dr. Horsberg holds faculty positions in the Department of Biostatistics, Department of Global Health, and Department of Medicine. He has decades of research focusing on tuberculosis, on non-tuberculous myobacterial infections, and opportunistic infections in AIDS. He will say a few words of welcome, and he'll then introduce today's facilitator and moderator, Dr. Susan Koo the director of the CIFAR. Professor Horsberg. Thank you, Dr. Galea. It's definitely a, a pleasure to be here. I just want to sort of set the stage for everyone. Uh, the global HIV epidemic, everyone is aware of it, uh, but we didn't used to know about it. Sometime, a long time ago, and we're not exactly sure how long ago it began, that's why the question mark there, uh, molecular studies suggest that it was about 70 to 80 years ago when this virus uh, jumped from chimpanzees, its normal host, into the human population. Uh, but really not much happened for a long time. There were a couple of very well uh, characterized cases of AIDS due to HIV in the 1950s, one in the US and one in Europe, but not much came of it until the 1970s when, lo and behold, all of a sudden, we recognized that there was a global epidemic that was occurring simultaneously in Africa and in uh, Europe and in the United States. And we didn't know what was causing it. It was just, a, it was defined by the fact that people were dying of unusual infections and complications and cancers that weren't seen very often. Uh, and so, of course, um, as an epidemiologist, I, this is a puzzle that uh, we want to uh, take a look at. And epidemi the, the crack epidemiology team at the, at, so how do I get this to go forward? Let's see. The green button. All right. Oop, nothing happened. It didn't go forward. Can we get, uh, the forward button. I have to aim it there. The crack epidemiology team at the National Enquirer uh, put together two and two. They noticed that for the very first time in history, the remains of uh, King Tut left Egypt and traveled around the United States between 1976 and 1979 uh, to exhibits in, among other places, San Francisco and New York. And they said, well, this obviously is, uh, uh, it happened just before the AIDS epidemic uh, became a big thing, and this must be the cause. Um, it turned out there were many such hypotheses that didn't, weren't uh, uh, 
um, confirmed. Uh, in 1983, Professor Luc Montagnier and his uh, group at the, uh, at the uh, Pasteur Institute identified the virus uh, that's come to be known as human, human immunodeficiency virus, and that uh, started the uh, very uh, Herculean efforts to combat this disease. Here we see what has happened over time. Uh, the epidemic continued to grow until the late 1990s when active, active, effective antiretroviral therapy became available. And at that time, we started to see uh, a decline in the epidemic, as you can see in the middle of the uh, graph here, uh, with a very marked uh, decrease in the blue line, HIV-related deaths, and a somewhat more gradual decrease in the incidence of HIV AIDS. This is consistent with the increasing availability of antiretroviral, effective antiretroviral treatment throughout the world. Uh, as I said, in 1995, it first became available. And uh, starting in 2000, we saw uh, greater and greater availability. Uh, we still don't have access for, to this uh, treatment for every patient in the world who needs it, but uh, we're working hard to get there. Currently, uh, we have almost 38 million people uh, living with HIV infection in the world, uh, 1.7 newly diagnosed cases, and still uh, eight-tenths of a million uh, HIV-related deaths each year. So we have a long way to go, but clearly the uh, curves are bending in the right direction. Who, uh, who are the people who are affected by HIV? It's a complex mix of people, sex workers, people who inject drugs, uh, men who have sex with men, transgender, and clients of sex workers. But a large proportion of the people who are affected have no specific risk factor, presumably were infected by HIV through heterosexual contact. Where are the gaps? This is the status of the global HIV epidemic uh, in the last year for which we have complete data. And we can see that the estimate of about 38 million people living with HIV uh, translates to uh, only about 79% of those people actually knowing that they have HIV. So there's a gap in the awareness that, of people that they have HIV. And then a continued gap between those who know they have HIV and those who are on effective treatment, and then uh, who are on treatment at all, and then another gap to the uh, suppression of viral load by effective treatment. You can see here in the blue, the arrows show the current targets of the WHO uh, uh, AIDS program to have 90% of people who, have, who are living with HIV be aware of their status, 90% of those be on treatment, and 90% of those be suppressed. So that is what we think it will take to end the epidemic, and now I will turn the podium over to Dr. Susan Kuyuvin to introduce our, our uh, next speaker. Dr. Kuyuvin is professor of obstetrics, gynecology, and medicine at Brown University School of Medicine and professor of health services policy and practice at Brown University School of Public Health. She's also the director of the Providence Boston CIFAR, uh, which is the co-sponsor of this event. She has spent her career studying HIV dynamics in the female genital tract, and she's also been a mentor to many junior researchers in this field. So Dr. Cuban, take it away. Thank you for inviting me to be part of this program. We are very proud to partner with Boston University Boston Medical Center, as we call the Providence Boston Center for AIDS Research. We have had the Center for AIDS Research for 20 years. We are going on our 21st year, but this is the first year that we're partnering with BU BMC. And for us, I think it's a great collaboration, and it has broadened our capacity to really answer the HIV AIDS epidemic, and also to be part of this program of eradicating the HIV AIDS epidemic. I look at the room, and I could probably divide it by people who were at the start of the epidemic, 
when there was nothing we could do except to take care of our patients. And we had one monotherapy that wasn't very, very good, that caused a lot of side effects. And then to this day, when I see all the young people around, where we have enormous amount of antiretrovirals from long, short acting, long acting, combination one pill, and much more work being done with prevention, with PrEP and PEP, as well as um, the idea of U equals U, undetectable is untransmittable. My work started in trying to find HIV in the genital tract, and I was telling people, you can have a below detectable viral load in your blood and still be shedding HIV in your genital tract. And I was one of those proponents of not believing U equals U will ever be. And yet here we are, undetectable is untransmittable. And beyond that, I think we have reached so many levels in understanding the virus that we can even think about eradicating the virus. And we are very privileged here today for Jonathan Merman, Dr. Jonathan Merman, who is the director of the National Center for HIV AIDS, Viral Hepatitis, STD, and TB Prevention, and a rear admiral of the US Public Health Service quite a handful. <laughs> he oversees the nation's effort to prevent HIV, viral hepatitis, sexually transmitted diseases, and tuberculosis. All infections affecting millions of people in the world, as well as in the United States. From 2009 to 2013, Dr. Mermin was director of the CDC's Division of HIV AIDS and Prevention overseeing the uh, agency's HIV efforts in the US. Then he was uh, served previously as the director of the CDC in Kenya. He was a uh, health attache of the US Embassy and also director of the CDC Uganda program and also uh, had worked with PEPFAR. So he has scanned the globe and he has worked a lot of his time in HIV AIDS, and today we're very privileged to have him with us, Dr. Merman. Well, thank you, Dr. Cube, and um, should I use just a thing? Got it. Okay, so first, so thank you, um, um, uh, Dr. Cuban and Bob and, and Dean Galea. I, I very much wanted to take part in this event, um, so much so that when my plane was diverted to Philadelphia because of the storm here, Catherine and Meredith checked to see if there were any seats on Amtrak to Boston. There were not. So I decided to take an Uber from Philadelphia to Boston in a snowstorm at night. And after that near-death experience, during which Shaheen, the Uber driver, and I truly bonded. <laughs> I realized that Dean Galea may not have invited me because of a history of safe decision making. <laughs> but just as Bill Bicknell had a zeal for doing good and getting good work done, I am here to tell you that story with regard to HIV and the unprecedented opportunity before us. I appreciate that all of you have come to take part in the snow, especially on World AIDS Day, a time that commemorates 40 years of the pain and inspiration, discrimination, and social change that underlie the HIV epidemic here in the United States and throughout the world. So the background of the Bicknell Lecture requires that we reflect on global and domestic experience. Partially, this has been because our nation is affected by what happens globally. And infectious diseases like HIV, and Ebola and influenza know no borders. I know my job this evening is to talk about HIV in the United States, but there 
is an exchange of knowledge between the international and domestic experience that shapes innovation. I learned a lesson several years ago that will be the theme of this talk, that to do good work in public health, we need to go underneath the veneer of reports and good intent and appreciate that knowing what to do is not the same as having it done. When I was living in Uganda, a close friend of mine was diagnosed with HIV and cryptococcal meningitis at the same time. Nakasero Hospital didn't have any fluconazole to treat the disease, even though Pfizer's free program was in place. The only way for her to survive was for us to drive to two all-night pharmacies and bring the medication to her bedside. Her experience highlighted gaps between what in theory was in place and what was actually being implemented. Why hadn't she ever been tested for HIV? Tens of millions of dollars had been spent on that. Why were the medications not available? They were required to be free. These experiences keep us honest and help us focus on implementing programs that work well and work quickly to reach out and listen to the people who are on the ground and sometimes not to trust the simple answer. Good public health and good HIV prevention require this, whether in Africa or the United States. And if we do this well, we will succeed. OK. I was asked to answer the question, is eradicating AIDS feasible? And the short answer is, can I change the question? <laughs> because AIDS is a collection of clinical signs of severe HIV disease. And only about half of people with HIV living in the US today have ever been diagnosed with AIDS. So focusing only on AIDS and not HIV would miss much of the epidemic and part of the need. And eradicating is defined as zero incidence of infection so that intervention measures are no longer needed. Yet there are 38 million people living with HIV in the world, and there is no cure. So eradication would be deeply troubling. However, disease elimination is defined as reduction to zero of the incidence of a disease in a defined geographic area where intervention measures continue to be required. And lately, WHO has begun to use the term elimination for a reduction that is not zero, but is so low that a disease does not pose a public health threat. So I believe we can answer the question, is eliminating new HIV infections feasible, at least with only a little hand waving? And if we define elimination as fewer than one new infection per 100,000 persons or fewer than 3,000 infections per year in the United States, the answer is yes. We actually can, not just in theory, but in practice. We can eliminate new HIV infections or end the epidemic in the United States. It is an aspirational and achievable goal, but it will take concerted action, and that's what I want to talk to you about tonight. So in the US, the federal deficit will be over $1 trillion in 2020, and life expectancy has decreased in the nation for the third year in a row. And this is not from HIV or any infectious disease. 69,000 people died of drug overdoses last year. In addition, 93 million Americans are obese and diabetes is increasing. So why should we care about HIV? People have asked me that, including family members who I have since disowned. <laughs> but truly, why, why do all of us on this panel have a sense of purpose, a sense of meaning in our daily lives? Why have we chosen to work in HIV, at a university, at a local, state, or federal um, agency, in clinics, in the community, in jails, and in schools? Well, first, over 700,000 Americans with HIV have already lost their lives. And today, every death from HIV is preventable. And each one highlights the failure of our public health, medical care, social, and economic structures. Second, about 20 $8 billion is spent annually by the US government on HIV, the vast majority for care and treatment. So good HIV prevention saves lives and money. And lastly, without intervention, an estimated 400,000 Americans will get HIV in the next 10 years. Preventing HIV matters for the people who get it, for their loved ones, and for our society as a whole. So how are we doing? Well, during the mid-1980s, 130,000 people were infected with HIV each year. That decreased to a relatively stable number until 2008, when concentrated efforts to shift funding to the most effective interventions and affected populations 
and geographic areas resulted in an 18% decline in incidence to about 40,000 new infections per year, saving more than $15 billion in estimated costs over time. But since 2014, the number of new HIV infections have stabilized. And during this time, more and more people are living with HIV. Why? Because the number of new HIV infections is greater than the number of people who die with HIV, a sign that we are continually doing better with treatment, but a growing challenge for prevention. For example, the number of people living with HIV in the country increased 50% between 1996 and 2016 to 1.1 million. A similar trend is occurring globally. At the same time, we're increasingly doing better at testing in the US with the proportion of people with HIV who know their status increasing from 75% to 86% from 2000 to 2016. And large disparities are seen geographically, with about 50% of all new HIV diagnoses occurring in only 50 local jurisdictions, shown in red, 48 counties, Washington, D.C., and San Juan, Puerto Rico, out of 3,300 counties in the U.S. And about 50% of the total occur in the southern U.S. The heavy burden of HIV in the South is driven in part by exacerbated socioeconomic factors. These factors are not unique to HIV. Income inequality, poverty, and poor health outcomes have long been more widespread in Southern states and some other places in the US when compared to the rest of the nation. Issues such as discrimination, homophobia, stigma, frequent incarceration, and homelessness can limit a person's ability to access and use HIV testing, care, and prevention services. So this concentration in a few geographic areas is also an opportunity. Even 75% of new HIV diagnoses occurred in only 148 counties, shown in red and orange, suggesting concentrated efforts, efforts could really make a difference. However, when we expand to the counties with 90% of the infections, we see that to fully succeed, we will ultimately need to address HIV throughout the nation. Viewing HIV only from 10,000 feet, however, belies that it is a quintessential example of public health inequity. HIV affects everyone, but not equally. HIV prevalence is over 150 times higher among men who have sex with men and transgender women than heterosexual men and women. And HIV incidence rates are eight times higher among African Americans and three times higher among Latinos than whites. Some of these differences are due to epidemiological reasons. In addition, many social and structural factors that exacerbate racial and ethnic health disparities in infection rates also create barriers to accessing health care, but they can be at least partially overcome by removing obstacles and ensuring an enabling environment, something I'll discuss later. And due in part to specifically focused efforts, there have been some areas where disparities are improving. Between 2010 and 2016, HIV diagnoses among African American women, shown in red, decreased overall, as did the relative disparity with other groups. Regardless of the measure, and it does frequently matter which measure is used, from 2010 to 2014, disparities in HIV diagnoses among women improved. The situation among gay and bisexual men, however, has been more complex. With a stabilization of rates in African American men, among whom rates had been increasing on the left and a decreasing rate among whites, shown below, but an increasing rate among Latinx MSM. However, young black and bisexual men, 13 to 24 years old, the previously most disproportionately affected group in America, has experienced a 2% decrease following a 114% increase during the prior five years. Now, regardless of race or ethnicity, the age group with the highest incidence is 25 to 34 year olds. Why are rates so high? For gay and bisexual men and transgender persons, the chance, at least statistically, that a partner, lover, or husband will have HIV infection is over 100 times higher than for heterosexuals. And anal sex is 18 times more likely to transmit HIV than vaginal sex. These epidemiological factors create a cycle where increasing prevalence leads to increased incidence that leads to increased prevalence, and so on. To reverse this, we need to create a beneficial cycle and reach a tipping point where HIV incidence is low enough that the total number of people with HIV is decreasing and the risk for everyone is lower each year. To do this, the coverage of services, whether testing, treatment, or prevention, needs to be even greater among populations most disproportionately affected by HIV. And when we reach that tipping point, decreases occur, as seen for many of the age groups here. 
Now, I believe there are several questions that, if solved, would lead us much farther along the path towards ending the epidemic. So I thought I would ask you to answer them, because we are at a great university, and I know the students and faculty here run towards problems rather than away from them, um, like scientific first responders. So the five I, I picked were, what is the best use of resources? What works, not just theoretically, but in the real world? What can we do about the social and economic determinants of health that are so integrally associated with HIV? What about behavior, and how can we best use behavioral economics? And how can we harness artificial intelligence and data science for public health? So what is the best use of human and financial resources currently available? To answer this question, we need to investigate what works, of that, what is cost effective or cost saving, and of that, what is feasible to bring to scale, and stop doing what doesn't meet these criteria. I wish I could say that we could start with tools available for many other infections, a vaccine or a cure. However, unlike smallpox, rinderpest, and polio, viruses that have been or will soon be eradicated solely through the use of a vaccine, or onchocerciasis, which will be eradicated primarily through treatment, HIV will require both direct prevention activities and effective treatment. And highly effective vaccine and a practical cure would be outstanding, but neither is on the nearby horizon. And because I am concerned about all of you reaching tenure or graduating before Dean Galea retires, I will focus on shorter term opportunities. So first, we know that elimination is theoretically possible. Multiple models, including one of the first ones on the right here, indicate that new HIV infections can be reduced to less than one per 1,000 person years in South Africa with annual HIV screening and universal antiretroviral therapy. This is because taking HIV medicine and achieving an undetectable viral load, meaning that the level of HIV in the blood is so low that routine tests can't detect it, has been proven in multiple studies to result in effectively no risk of sexual transmission to a partner, just as Dr. Kuven mentioned. So we should be able to treat ourselves out of the epidemic. And we should be able to prevent all new HIV infections by providing interventions to people without HIV. For example, through pre-exposure prophylaxis or PrEP. PrEP involves taking a pill a day that is about 99% effective at preventing HIV acquisition through sex. The use of PrEP in the US has increased dramatically. For example, going from 6% to 35% in three years among gay and bisexual men at risk in one CDC study in major cities. But this is not enough. Uh, since we've estimated that 1.2 million people could potentially benefit from PrEP. Another in intervention is syringe service programs, or SSPs. These programs ensure access to sterile injection equipment. They've been shown to reduce the risk of HIV and hepatitis C by 50%, and it's even greater when they're linked to substance use treatment. Lastly, education about risk reduction and access to condoms prevent HIV acquisition, and all of these interventions are cost-saving. We can also use new science. Existing surveillance data allows health departments to detect and respond early to new clusters and outbreaks. For example, the first 60 growing HIV clusters CDC identified had a rate of 44 new infections per 100 person years compared with a national average transmission rate of less than four. We've seen the utility of this approach in outbreaks ranging from people who inject drugs in Indiana, West Virginia, and Massachusetts to MSM in Texas. And this requires bringing testing, treatment, and PrEP services to the people and areas that need them most. And recent modeling indicates that using multiple strategies like these will dramatically reduce infections in American cities, like Baltimore and Atlanta, and effectively eliminate new infections there if fully implemented. So the new Ending the HIV Epidemic Initiative proposed in the fiscal year 2020 budget incorporates the science it has a stated goal of a 75% reduction in annual new HIV infections over five years and 90% in 10 years. It's focused on four pillars, diagnosing as many people with HIV as possible, treating people with HIV medication, preventing infections through effective interventions such as PrEP and syringe service programs and condoms, and detecting and responding to HIV clusters and outbreaks as soon as possible. Doing this and decreasing disparities at the same time through leadership and decision making by the communities involved is essential. So this seems like sound science, but given George Box's maxim, all models are wrong, some are useful, what works in the real world? And I wanted to find some examples. 
There is a correlation between higher proportion of people taking ART and HIV incidence. In a population-based study in KwaZulu-Natal, for every 1% increase in ART coverage, there was a 1% reduction in HIV incidence. However, shown on the right, several large-scale population-based combination prevention trials involving tens of thousands of participants that many people, including I, thought would be wildly successful had no reductions in incidence or less than anticipated. And I look forward to Dr. Ailes and Dr. Sikazwe explaining this mystery to us later in the discussion. In the US, we have also had some trouble reaching our goals. This is the continuum of care for people with HIV in the country. An estimated 86% of people with HIV know they have the virus, but only 53% were estimated to be virally suppressed. This is because not only are there about 150,000 people who don't know they have HIV, but 240,000 who do, but aren't receiving regular care, and an additional 120,000 who are, but aren't virally suppressed. Most, well, and looking at this from the perspective of prevention, people with HIV who don't know their status can inadvertently transmit to others. In the US, the average time from infection to diagnosis is three years, less than it used to be, but not good enough. HIV testing should be normalized, as common as screening for cholesterol or diabetes. In addition, we need to enable people at high risk to be tested at least once a year through clinics and community organizations, through home testing and other innovative approaches. Yet, these practices are not done often enough. This is why, in data modeled in this table, the 51% of people with HIV who are virally suppressed are associated with no new transmissions, but the 38% of people with HIV who are either undiagnosed or not receiving regular medical care are associated with 81% of transmissions. PrEP also works in the real world, not just for individuals, but communities. In the graph on the left, red lines show stable HIV testing in London, but during the same time shown in blue, HIV positive tests dramatically decreased. This coincided with a strong effort for PrEP access in London spearheaded by community activists. And we have seen similar indications of success with PrEP in the United States in a few areas, such as San Francisco, but overall PrEP uptake in this country has been slower than hoped, particularly among African Americans and Latinx persons, in part because there are areas in the country where PrEP is less accessible, as shown in this map of distance to a PrEP provider with orange, red, or brown, meaning a greater than 60-minute drive. Use of syringe service programs in rapid response to clusters of HIV is also showing promise. This figure shows diagnoses of HIV among people who inject drugs in a small town in Indiana. Ultimately, 235 people were diagnosed with HIV, resulting in an HIV prevalence of 5%, the highest in the nation, with over $100 million of lifetime medical care costs. However, I also wanted to highlight how an exuberant public health response, ultimately involving people at the community, state, and federal levels, was able to control the outbreak an outbreak that was exacerbated by the fact that people were injecting oxymorphone, a prescription opioid. Because of its short half-life and the need to dissolve in relatively large amounts of water, people injected on average five times a day, often sharing needles and syringes, increasing the chance that HIV and hepatitis C virus would spread. Nevertheless, establishing a syringe services program, ensuring access to sterile injection equipment, and linking people to HIV treatment controlled the outbreak. However, the community is and will be at constant risk for another outbreak, as currently there are about 300 people living there who inject drugs and don't have HIV. So the varying program coverage and epidemiology of HIV at the local level means that trends in HIV diagnoses are also different. For example, between 2011 and 2016, we saw major reductions in HIV diagnoses in Washington, D.C., Rhode Island, and parts of Atlanta but we also saw increases in Nevada, Arizona, and Arkansas. We'll need to implement whatever is necessary to reach the tipping point if we are to reach the new initiative's targets. So one of the major reasons for the differences among cities in the last slide are social and economic. For those of us in public health, we spend much of our time identifying associations with poor health outcomes, from income and education to racism and homophobia all major factors in different HIV incidence rates across jurisdictions. And we can feel overwhelmed that these are issues larger than our capacity to change. So we publish data hoping others will use it for good. But I'd like to argue that the levers for so societal change are within our power, and we don't need to eliminate pover poverty and racism to get there, but we do need to recognize these factors and directly address the solutions. 
One example is homelessness. Being homeless is associated with higher likelihood of having a detectable viral load. The federal government has implemented a program called Housing Opportunities for AIDS, or HOPWA. The program receives $393 million annually to provide housing services for persons with HIV. In addition, the government provides treatment, care, and support services to people with HIV through the Ryan White Care Program and the AIDS Drug Assistance Program, which together receive $3.1 billion annually. And they work. Over half of Ryan White clients are below 100% of the federal poverty level. Half are African American and one quarter are Latinx. Yet last year, almost 87% of clients were virally suppressed. Among uninsured clients, almost 77% receiving Ryan White services were virally suppressed compared with 39% among those not receiving Ryan White services. And participants in Ryan White, which supports half of all the people with HIV receiving care in the US, were 5% more likely to be virally suppressed than persons with private insurance. We've also seen decreases in race and ethnicity associated disparities in viral suppression among participants in the program, as seen in the graph on the right. The Ryan White Care Program does not eliminate the fundamental social determinants of poverty, racism, homophobia, and transphobia, but it increasingly is successful at improving health outcomes and decreasing disparities by addressing more distal obstacles. Other programs also work. For example, providing medication-assisted therapy for opioid use disorder decreased HIV acquisition by 54% among persons who injected drugs. And for those who had HIV, medication-assisted therapy resulted in a 45% increase in the odds of viral suppression. Systematically treating substance use disorder as a medical illness rather than a moral failing prevents HIV and improves health. So what about behavior? Where there used to be so much talk about changing risk behavior that sex would dominate HIV conferences. Talking about it, not doing it. And now, not so much. Yet structural change can nudge people to healthy behavior, whether related to risk or care. How can we best apply behavioral economics to HIV? So first, why should we care when the interventions shown on this slide are essentially 100% effective? People do not get HIV if they do not have sex or inject drugs. Condoms are 100% effective, at least in laboratory studies. Antiretroviral therapy and PrEP work when taken as prescribed. But none of these work perfectly in practice. Because of that, most of the questions put before us are ones of implementation. How can we do the best with the resources we have? So, and how can we make the healthy option the default option? We know that humans make decisions at times of heightened emotion or arousal that are not aligned with our prior decisions, even at just a few minutes earlier. But in an ideal situation, people won't have to think about avoiding risk because it is happening as a side benefit. The concept of nudging people to make healthier decisions has been mainly used in the sphere of chronic diseases. For example, putting healthier options in vending machines so people don't snack on potato chips, smoke-free buildings so people have to go outside to use tobacco and airbags so that people are safer in a car crash. What would this look like for HIV? In a national sample, 70% of adolescents reported condom use during their last sex. However, only 22% of women and 25% of men of all ages reported condom use. Why? Couples stop using condoms over time. Men and women are greater than five times less likely to use a condom if they had sex more than 10 times previously. We need improved technology. So the Gates Foundation awarded $1 million in research grants to develop a condom that, quote, significantly preserves or enhances pleasure, unquote. One of those projects is here at BU. But so far, this grand challenge has not been successful. And given the importance of the issue, if not the technological challenge, when wearing a condom feels better than not wearing one, people will be more likely to use them. What would nudging people to success look like for syringe service programs? linkage to care, or medication adherence. Another area for creating an enabling environment for success are sexually transmitted infections. Because of inflammation and mucosal susceptibility, having syphilis, gonorrhea, or chlamydia doubles the chance a person will acquire HIV, and similarly, they double the chance a person with HIV will transmit to their partner. The population attributable fraction of STIs for HIV infection, in other words, the proportion of HIV that is caused by STDs in the US is high because of the overlap in populations. 
For example, half of men with syphilis have HIV. So screening and treating people with HIV for STDs and preventing STDs in general, which are in the background increasing HIV incidence, would decrease new HIV infections. Another area for nudging success is related to adherence. Many people have difficulty taking daily medication. There are a number of ongoing trials examining long-acting ART and PrEP, including intravaginal rings, long-acting implants that can last for six to 12 months, injectable agents that can last for eight weeks, and passive antibodies. When these become available, particularly implants, the concept of adherence will change and the real world effectiveness of ART and PrEP will grow. Another area for setting a healthy default option is by normalizing routine HIV testing. CDC recommends that all adults get tested for HIV at least once, and people at higher risk get tested at least annually. Yet these guidelines have been sadly ignored by many. One way to increase testing is to weave it into existing programs. When the Veterans Administration adopted our guidelines, they doubled testing rates. And the facilities that included automatic electronic health record prompts increased testing fourfold in a two-year period. Ideally, HIV screening is conducted on samples drawn for other reasons, like a complete blood count or hemoglobin A1C, and added on. Similarly, New York was concerned that many people were not getting hepatitis C testing even though it was recommended. So they passed a hepatitis C testing law in 2014 and testing increased 52% among baby boomers. Making the healthy action easy when people are already receiving health care takes out the individual effort for patients and providers and improves outcomes. So another area where new technology can help is sex. It's less pleasant to talk about sex than it is to have it. Yet if we aren't explicitly discussing sex and the risks of different sex acts, as well as protective measures, people will not have the knowledge to protect themselves. Sex education is surely more effective than what can often be found on the internet. But perhaps the internet itself has not been fully utilized for, for prevention. CDC developed an online risk reduction tool that shows the different risks associated with vaginal, anal, and oral sex and the protective effects of ART, PrEP, and condoms. At the same time, I recognize that for many of our communication campaigns, we are using the traditional marketing techniques of posters and billboards and pamphlets, the same ones used by the founding fathers. Yet Google knows exactly who we are and can predict our behavior. If you've recently had an accident and searched for an auto body shop, you know the next time you open your browser, you're going to see ads for a new car, eyeglasses, and couples counseling. This consumer behavior data is available to us in public health as well. We may, may not be able to see the data or the algorithms, but there's no reason we can't take a page out of other marketers' book and deliver focused public health messages to those who would benefit most. Public health does not need to be behind the times. And similarly, social media has changed with whom we identify and trust. We make decisions relying on the advice of strangers who we think are our friends. However, these powerful influencers are often paid to tell us what to eat, what to do to stay healthy, and whether to vaccinate our children. And they know their audience. But the success of influencers lies in the fact that they've created a trusted brand and voice. If chosen strategically, influencers can turn our public HIV prevention and care information into engaging content that resonates with their audience and our communities. Technology also has the potential to revolutionize positive engagement with people to promote health. This is an area where there's already been productive examples from medication dosing reminders and HIV test site or PrEP provider locators to wearable monitors. How else can we use apps to streamline and improve care and prevention? Like social media, the internet of things is becoming more ubiquitous and public health will want to evolve with technology. So lastly, I want to touch on an area that's already changing clinical care but has not yet been embraced by public health. This is artificial intelligence and big data science. Artificial intelligence is already better than the best pathologists at reading histological specimens. And it's better than the best radiologists at reading images. Used well, it could improve health by providing a service to improve patient care by examining data in ways that traditional statistical analyses cannot. For example, 
Worldwide and in the United States, the biggest gap in the continuum of care is people falling out of care. Could we use AI and data from electronic health records to predict who would benefit from patient navigation and extra support services before people fall out of care? Could we learn who would benefit from PrEP support services and ultimately how to improve those services so that they are more effective? At the same time that there is positive potential, we should be wary of AI's potential ability to continue implicit biases present in the original data sets. So in conclusion, eliminating HIV is theoretically possible and practically achievable. Although HIV incidence has stabilized in the nation overall, there's been substantial success in a variety of geographical areas and populations showing what is possible with a mobilized, supported community, concerted action, and appropriate resources. We can address social determinants and improve outcomes. There are several systems in place that already work. To bring the nation to ending the epidemic, we need thoughtful, innovative science and implementation and taking advantage of new technology. In the end, success requires community leadership and energy. In the world of HIV, that's always been the case. Many of us in public health started as activists in HIV because public health armed us with the tools for change. I wish I could say that we have already ended the epidemic and eliminated the deep inequities that underpin HIV in the world. But the data and many of our personal experiences don't support that. However, I do think that the arc of the HIV epidemic in America bends towards elimination. And today, more than any time in the past 40 years, we have the tools and the knowledge to reverse what is one of the worst epidemics in recorded history. And I want to thank these people for assisting with this talk. Thank you. I'm just curious about, uh, sorry, Sydney Rosen from Boston University. I'm just curious about the, U, the CDC's advice to have every, all adults tested once. Is it everything, it seems like it's not the greatest use of resources given how risk varies across a population and the fact that our adult lives do last a fairly long time. I'm, I'm wondering about the rationale for that guidance. Mm -hmm. So, so two things. One is the, the, there's the model indicates that in certain populations, more frequent testing can also be beneficial. Um, but what happens is if we have um, complex demographic or behavioral factors that take um, that are that have to be taken into account to decide to do an HIV test, the test is frequently not conducted, and that's what's been happening with many of our our risk-based testing recommendations. Um, so we have, so the idea is though the mo that if we could have a system in place that people get at least one test and then people at higher risk are tested more frequently, that would catch people who we may either, um, the system doesn't know is at risk or um, who are at low risk because they're at low risk but they can still get HIV infection. Um, the, uh, the, the, ultimately over time we could potentially re uh, see whether that is still uh, necessary. One of the aspects of the guidelines that is incorporated in the original version is that um, once you've implemented screening at a, a health center, uh, you should examine how what is the prevalence of undiagnosed infection. And the, the level that we've recommended is 0.1% or greater of undiagnosed infection. So if you have one in a thousand tests having an undiagnosed person, it's still highly cost uh, effective. It's cost saving to actually conduct testing. If it gets lower than that, it's probably best to just to switch over to only risk-based screening. And there are some um, clinical sites that have actually found that either initially when they start, they're at lower than that rate, or they actually get to that because their catchment population has, has, um, has decreased in HIV uh, uh, prevalence, undiagnosed prevalence. Oh, thanks. Uh, Jeffrey Samet from Boston University. Um, kind of a compliment to Sydney's question being um, communities aren't at equal risk either. You showed a map that communities can vary highly, and yet I didn't hear a strategy uh, proposed that would 
differentially target communities at higher risk or lower risk. Mm -hmm. So, so the, the new initiative actually does start off focusing on the 50 uh, local jurisdictions in the seven states, that, at least the 50 lo local jurisdictions that have 50% of the epidemic. And that's a, line, you know, a list that just goes down by, by number. Um, so some of that is high risk. If you live in a city in America, you're three times more likely to have HIV than if you live in a rural area. But some of it is that there's actually um, more people living in these areas than, than in other more rural areas. So screening and other kind of interventions make sense. So the idea is that you would focus, um, all of our interventions should be prioritized for the populations most affected geographically or otherwise. Ultimately though, if you were going to truly succeed at getting below um, the elimination threshold, we're going to need to reach even people who are, you know, in rural areas, and we need to think about that. But the, um, the, there's actually some interesting situations where people in rural areas have actually been very successful at truly reducing HIV incidence. Iowa is one um, where they, they actually don't have a very high number of people living with HIV. They don't have a high number of people. But, what they, but they've actually took on HIV very seriously um, in the, and they were able to have dramatic reductions in incidence and very high viral suppression rates because um, they, they actually were able to kind of set up a cohort system as, as much as possible where people with HIV, like people with TB, are, 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 are supported to take their medication and ultimately to be virally suppressed. Hi, thank you so much for your talk. Um, you had shown the slide on kind of stealing the playbook from other marketers and using influencers and big data to kind of innovate our communications campaigns. Can you talk about what strategies the federal government might be thinking about in terms of reaching young, black, gay, and bisexual, and other MSM in the South, kind of using those mm -hmm. techniques? Mm -hmm. So I'd say I, I, I raised that slide because I think it's an, a gap that we all need to think about. Um, you know, we about eight or nine years ago, we, when we started to see that increase in very young um, in HIV infections among very young gay and bisexual men uh, who are African American, we actually did raise the alarm, and that was a kind of the traditional public health alarm raising. We also increased funding for that, those populations, and we saw that decrease. So I think even traditional methods can actually work if they're focused and if the community knows what's going on and can actually you know, get the support to respond. I think in this case, we don't know what this would look like, um, but ideally it would be people who are very good at this, and there are people at this university and others who know how to do that, as, and, and less so in, in, um, in traditionally in health departments, but I think increasingly people are understanding the potential risks and benefits of things like dating apps and other methods to, to reach people. There's also some things that are not best done by the federal government, and one could think that one of them might be um, some of the ways of reaching people through social media that we really need to rely on communities and, and others to be able to, to um, be more explicit and, and actually reach out in ways that we would not be as able to do. So I look forward to your, um, your program in the next couple of years. <laughs> Another question? I do have a question. Yeah. Is there any way that this, they can talk together and do a more comprehensive program rather than Ryan White just doing Ryan White, housing just doing housing, and you know substance mm -hmm. use doing substance mm -hmm. use? Because one way or the other, our patients are going to fail one of the rules, and mm -hmm. they can't get everything. It, there's a. Um, a lot of desire 
to have more integrated systems, both at the, at, I think, that the federal programs that are running those programs as well as on the ground. And there's some successful examples where that kind of blending has occurred very effectively at either health centers or community programs. Um, there's an increased interest in making it easier to do that um, so, that it, so that you can actually, that the resources are more flexible. Um, and some of that um, will depend on legislative priorities and some are just actionable within the existing policy systems and that these programs have. But ultimately, it's that blending is best to occur at the place where people are receiving their services. And, um, and we are trying to think about what that would look like. Um, we, we, CDC actually, um, using money from the Minority AIDS Fund that's controlled out of the um, Office of the Assistant Secretary for Health this fiscal year, we're able to actually put out resources to these 57 jurisdictions to develop plans with the community. And what that will that do is a lot of the uh, counties that are involved have never developed a, a, a jurisdictional HIV plan, which can be very common in other places. Um, and that, it, it, that we, there are requirements of who would participate, including people with HIV and other people affected by HIV, in this process so that those plans are more comprehensive. And then when the resources are requested later through the, the kind of funding streams from the federal government, the idea is that those plans would have more integration and that we would be able to make sure that that's happening. Um, I can say that it, it can still be frustrating. I'm working in a bureaucracy my whole life. Um, it, 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 can, it can be hard because you can see simple things that you wish you could change. Sometimes they're just representing the tip of a bureaucratic iceberg that can't be changed, and sometimes it's very easy. And, and once it's been identified, you can actually uh, make that change. And I think the idea of having that kind of communication on the ground and then also having a free communication with the different um, state and federal agencies would be helpful. Okay. Any other questions? If not, thank you. Dr. Thank you. on to our panel and we have very distinguished uh, visitors for our panel both locally and internationally each speaker will be given 10 minutes to speak uh, I would like to request that you reserve all your questions until all the panelists are done and then when that is done we will open the panel to discussion so first of our panel um, discussions and I hope I pronounce your name correctly, Isukanji Sikazwe. Um, she's the executive director of the Center for Infectious Diseases Research in Zambia. I think many of us know it as CDR, uh, CIDRZ. She is an infectious disease physician, an HIV program expert, a clinical researcher who has been funded by the NIH the CDC, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the World Health Organization. She has served as deputy CEO since joining CIDRZ in 2013. And she is currently involved in numerous programs that really are the heart of how we deal with HIV. And we are very lucky to have her today to discuss her thoughts about I'm going to change that. Uh, ending the HIV epidemic or uh, ending new HIV infections. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Kuven. And I hope I'm able to um, work this gadget that you have. And um, I'm glad you said you're very lucky to have me here. If I'd known what the weather was like, I think I'd have turned down the invitation. <laughs> so like um, Dr. Merriman, you know, I, I was looking at the topic, is eradicating HIV feasible? And I thought, well, we already have a good handle on eradicating um, AIDS, I think. We have the tools to be able to deal with um, AIDS in our patient, and it's a constellation of various um, infectious processes or um, non-infectious processes that leads to the AIDS um, stage. So I changed also my talk to eradicating HIV. <laughs> so if you had asked me this uh, more than um, about 20 years ago when I was a fresh medical student in the clinical wards, I'd have said, no, it's not feasible. At that time, I was personally impacted or affected seeing family members or friends 
uh, infected with HIV and then getting into the clinical wards and seeing just the despair and uh, devastation of patients that were taken care of, I didn't think it was possible. But with time and working uh, within the program, I have now changed my position and I said, yes, it is possible to eradicate HIV and it's possible within my lifetime. Um, so 40 years on, and I won't go through this slide because a lot of this inf uh, information has already been shared, but 40 years on, we're still battling with not having a definitive cure for HIV and we've lost a lot of friends, colleagues, and um, others along the way, but I remain um, hopeful. Um, I'm going to focus my talk on what's needed and what are we missing. So in terms of what um, are we missing, is that I think we've really spent a lot of our time over the last uh, 40 years in terms of um, uh, focusing our, our energies on treatment access and scale up. But we know that um, treatment, as has been shown in various uh, clinical trials, does reduce your viral burden, does reduce the risk of transmission. But treatment is only useful if you're able to diagnose those that are HIV infected and has been talked about in the uh, last few minutes. We have to be able to find those populations that are, are not diagnosed. And then once you do diagnose them, uh, your clients or your patients want, will have to want to start treatment and stay on treatment. And as Ruben Greenwich um, and Robbie Williams um, said in a paper just recently published, is that getting to 90, 90, 90 is not enough to end the epidemic because this just results in about 73% of your patients actually being virally suppressed. So you do have a good proportion of your patients still uh, with transmittable virus. So getting to 90, 90, 90 just won't be good enough for us. Um, so I think we need to shift our attention to understanding and addressing the undiagnosed people living with HIV and then understanding and addressing, and, and addressing the complexities around new infections. And more importantly, especially from the work that we've done in my group, understanding heterogeneity within populations and who we are actually missing. Um, this slide was shown a little bit with the first presenter, but I'll concentrate on the um, second, uh, bar graph, uh, on the second um, graph there, and it's for Eastern and Southern Africa. And you can see that for us, we're battling with um, the general population, heterosexual transmission, which accounts for 83% of um, new HIV infections. So if we concentrate a lot on the key population or priority populations, we really lose our focus as 83% of the infection is coming from heterosexual uh, transmission. That's not to say that the key and priority populations are not important. And um, looking at who is getting trans, uh, HIV transmission or new infections in our population, it's really the young adults, young um, adolescents and young women, as well as the men. And this picture is one of the clinics that we support um, through the public sector using PEPFAR and CDC funds. And you can see how overcrowded it is. And what you see there are, uh, is really just women and their children and very few men and very few um, young individuals, so young, you don't see the adolescents or the young boy or the young men there, but mostly women. And some of our qualitative work that we, ha that we have from a group of adolescents that we interviewed said that, you know, people our age are afraid to go to the clinics because they're overpopulated, we're stigmatized, um, uh, adults or healthcare providers in those facilities don't understand that we're sexually active and it's against our norms. So there's um, stigma that they're dealing with and that prevents them from going to the health facilities. And on the quote in the left-hand side, there's a young lady who said that she told her friends that don't be afraid, afraid to go to the health facilities because there is no cure there. There's no, there's no cure there, uh, but there is a place where I go and you can get the HIV self-test kit and test yourself at home. So we have to think of those um, strategies to improve testing. And um, another key thing is understanding our client preferences. What we found in our program was that um, a lot of our patients were lost to follow up. So more than 20% of patients who start treatment drop off um, the care, uh, care, uh, continuum of care by 12 months. And when we looked at this lost patient, we were able to um, find our key um, answers. Uh, we were able to answer key questions about this patient. So we found out why patients were dropping out, who exactly was dropping out, when they were dropping out, and uh, what were their outcomes? Were they still alive? Were they still on treatment? Had they transferred somewhere else? And which, uh, where were these hotspots for poor patient outcomes in terms of facilities or districts? 
And uh, what we did with a proportion of patients who had dropped out and we traced them and found them within the communities was to really try and find out what is it about the healthcare facility that would make you want to go back. So we conducted uh, discrete choice experiments and pre presented them with hypothetical um, health facilities, clinic A and clinic B, and provided them with uh, five different attributes of those health facilities to try and find out what, we, what it is about a facility that would make them want to go to that facility. So you can see that we asked them whether the, um, on the time that they'd spend at the facility, the distance to the facility, the number of refills they'd have to have, uh, whether they can get one month refill or three months refill, whether they would be attended by a nice caring nurse or somebody who was rude, and the hours of operation. And what we found among 200, almost 300 uh, participants who were lost and uh, took part in the discrete choice experiments was that when we standardized um, the distance to the health facility as being more than 45 kilometers away or waiting in a health facility for more than 19 hours, um, these clients preferred to have staff that were nice to them and, be, and that they, they preferred to have services in a facility that had staff that were nice to them even though these facilities were 45 kilometers away or they had to wait five hours or, uh, or longer to see those um, uh, nice providers. So being able to be cared for by a provider who was nice to them was important for them. And this is a paper that we published from that work, and um, I think the title says it all, They Care Rudely. So that was a recurring theme that we saw as we did our qualitative work. And this is a quote by one of the patients that had disengaged from care. And um, they said, when you go to the clinic and ask questions, they would shout at you but they're not supposed to shout at us. Instead, they're supposed to encourage that person. But, but just to say the truth, one of the reasons why I stopped care is because they, they shout at us very much. They are rude. And another disengaged patient also said that, ah, they care rudely. So this theme of caring rudely comes across quite often, and therefore we have to be able to be cognizant of it and look out for what our clients um, are looking for in terms of the services that we need. Uh, moving forward, what is needed? I won't go through this slide because it's been adequately tackled uh, by Dr. Merman. So uh, we'll talk about progress in HIV prevention in sub-Saharan Africa and really focus on my country, Zambia, that's in the orange. And you can see that um, countries within my region are really not doing well in terms of reducing the number of new HIV infections. And according to the UNAIDS, um, um, countries like Zambia are walking instead of running or scoring to reduce the number of new HIV infections. In terms of new hor horizons, I'm here to make a case for an HIV cure. When I first started to work on this project, it, sent, um, it made me have goose pimples or goose flesh because just the thought of having a cure for HIV was imaginable to me. And I think even now I get really, really excited about it and the reasons for pushing this agenda forward. So when you look at the evolution of HIV cure right now, we're still having daily treatment with um, effective ART, and very soon we're moving over to long-acting ART with injectables. But I want to take you to the right side of this uh, timeline, where we start looking at first generation all the way to third generation, and possibly a single short cure that is uh, currently being worked on. Uh, there, is, there are two technical working groups. Um, uh, that have been put together. The first one is looking at the target product profile, and this is co-chaired by Dr. Sharon Lerwin and Dr. Stephen Deeks, and includes um, various leaders from the ph pharmaceutical industry that are looking to develop a target product profile uh, that, will be, that will be applicable for cure in low- and middle-income countries, and then to share this um, product very widely with other users. There's a second uh, a technical working group that I co-chair with Mark Dybel, which is the HIV Cure Africa Acceleration Partnership. Again, we're bringing together all stakeholders and trying to socialize the concept of a cure for uh, resource-limited settings. We're working in partnership with the TTP group um, so that when the product is actually ready, uh, society, pro um, policymakers, communities will actually be acceptable and ready to uh, implement it. Um, very recently in the last month, you may have heard this announcement from the NIH and the Bill Melinda Gates Foundation where they um, allocated new funding um, up to $200 million, $100 million from NIH 
and uh, matched by the Gates Foundation to work towards finding a gene-based uh, uh, therapy intervention or cure for both sickle cell disease and HIV. And I'll end by saying that communities do make a difference, and we've seen this evidently in our work. I'd like to thank and acknowledge uh, all the people that make our work possible, uh, importantly the patients and the frontline um, providers who make the possibility of an HIV-free generation a possibility, as well as the funders and the Zambian Ministry of Health. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Douglas Brooks. He is the Executive Director, Community Engagement for Gilead Sciences. Douglas is a social worker, began his career in HIV AIDS at his work in Provis Provincetown AIDS Support Group. He went on to become the Senior Vice President for Community, Health, and Public Policy at the Justice Resource Institute, a regional health and human service agency with a range of residential and community-based services in Massachusetts, Rhode Island, Connecticut, Pennsylvania. He also previously served as executive director of the Sydney Borum um, Health Center. Uh, Douglas has occupied many positions, including the National HIV AIDS Strategy, the policy that makes five years program for how we deal with HIV and AIDS. He has joined the Presidential Advisory Council on HIV and AIDS. He has liaised with many different government as well as non-government organizations. And it's wonderful to be able to hear somebody who represents the community within the pharmaceutical industry. Douglas Brooks. Good afternoon. Okay, you know when we black people get up and say good afternoon, you have to say good afternoon back to us. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Hi. Uh, so I too posed and wondered, uh, so first thank you Dean Galea for um, the invitation to be here. And uh, for me, Massachusetts uh, was home for me for many, many years for uh, almost 25 years, and I want to acknowledge my friend and the Dean for Public Health Practice, um, Dean Cox, as well as Monica Valdez Lupe from the Boston Public Health Commission, and my dear friend Don Facuda from the Massachusetts Department of Public Health, people who've been doing the work for a really long time. So I was thinking about the question, can we eradicate AIDS? I too uh, thought of a story from my time at the White House uh, running the Office of National AIDS Policy. We'd been working for quite some time on a document that we were about to put out. And just before we went to print, something in my gut said, you need to check on your use of language here, uh, that we needed to check on the use of the term ending uh, HIV or ending AIDS. And uh, so I reached out to a group of people who I affectionately called my kitchen cabinet. and. Uh, I also decided that it was important to reach out to some folks who uh, were not necessarily uh, great friends, and uh, some of them didn't even like me very much, but uh, who are really smart, thoughtful people who care about their communities and who are strong leaders in their community to ask uh, about use of the question. I openly copied everyone on the email with an expectation that there might be uh, some debate, but there was very little. The resounding response was that we should use the term ending the HIV epidemic or breaking the back of the epidemic. Our use of just ending HIV without that modifier, we were told, can lead to some people living with HIV, hearing the question is asking whether we could, should, or would uh, attempt to eradicate, end, or stop them. So, I'm a person living with HIV for over 30 years. The question doesn't bother me. It doesn't even annoy me. Uh, but it was just a wonderful opportunity to think about uh, language and think about uh, how people receive it. So I've learned to ask the question, um, ending it as a public health threat or, or something close. I don't raise this to be judgmental. I don't raise it to be pro provocative. Rather, I think it's cogent in a conversation 
where we're seriously considering whether we can end a plague that has caused such devastation in the way that HIV and AIDS has. It's also important to me that when I'm in an academic setting to have at top of mind the students and any opportunity that an old coot like me may be able to share some lessons learned. So in that previous scenario, I will say to you, one, listen to your gut. If something feels wrong, it probably is. Number two, even when we're members of the priority population and have years or decades of experience, an N of one is rarely a great idea. Number three, don't just ask your friends. There will be people with whom you lack a personal or professional connection or alignment who are at least as, if often more so, committed to the well-being of the communities that they serve and represent. And four, while it sounds obvious, people who don't feel seen or heard or who think our efforts are designed to terminate them likely won't hear our messages. As a graduate of the School of Social Work of this university and someone who considers himself a public health practitioner, given that I've spent most of my career focused on developing, managing, and leading programs that provide for the care and support of people living with HIV, the prevention of HIV, and engaging, supporting, and challenging, and sometimes outright fighting the systems that impact the lives of those people, I'm quite thrilled to be here today and to join this wonderful body of thinkers and leaders. Notably, I think our conversation here today provides a delightful opportunity to reflect on the intersection of social works foundation, general systems theory, and public health focus on population health. The former asserts that systems that people are and the systems they encounter are interrelated and interdependent. While they may maintain homeostasis or riddled with entropy, there are multiple opportunities for entry points and for helpful interventions. Likewise, population health suggests that we must look beyond the individual and consider outcomes and the distribution of those outcomes across groups of people to really understand what's going on. Ultimately, from my perspective, the marriage of these theories and the attendant practices dictate that we have leader, that we who are leaders, gatekeepers, or officials of varying types are ultimately servants who must use our authority, talents, knowledge, and service to advocate for people's health, yes, but not just their physical health. We cannot look at an individual in isolation, but must consider her, him, its, circumstances, conditions, and multiple influences and we have a mandate to press for their economic health, their environmental health, their mental health, social equity, and every necessary asset, which ensures that the people, the places where they live, where they work, where they pray, and where they play are healthy and support well-being and justice. At the risk of causing a little embarrassment, I turn to the words of the dean of this school to illustrate that point. I receive regular email updates from SSW and SPH, and I often take a look at them, take a peek at them, and keep moving, but I often stop when something pops for me. This happened most recently a few days ago when Dean Galea's notes on the Transgender Day of Remembrance popped up. To start, the fact that the note was even there warmed my heart, and then I read it. In discussing public health and this school of public health's role in advancing transgender justice, he writes, first, we're charged with generating the knowledge that can guide public discussions and thinking about this issue and many others. This means we have to do the intellectual work that elevates human dignity and human rights as a core mission of public health and work that emphasizes how marginalization and structural discrimination of any group adversely affect that group's health and diminishes us all. I want to repeat that. First, we are charged with generation the knowledge that can guide public discussions and thinking about this issue and many others. This means we have to do the intellectual work that elevates human dignity and human rights as a core mission of public health and work that emphasizes how marginalization and structural discrimination of any group adversely affect the, that group's health and diminish us all. Why did I repeat that? 
Because my friends, this is the answer to the question, can we eradicate AIDS? John, Dr. Merman has already told us that the science exists, that we have the tools that we need. He suggests that there are opportunities for innovation. I agree with him 100%. But what really remains is the will, the intestinal fortitude, and inexorable commitment. What I believe Dr. Galeo, Dean Galeo is saying is that we cannot have a reality-based conversation about ending AIDS without fighting for the basic human dignity for our transgender sisters and brothers, that in order to end the painful disparities that slap young gay black men in the face, we must join them and sometimes help carry the, get the burden until they can carry it for themselves after being beaten down so. Tell me how with all the science that has been described so well, we can allow a statistic like one in two black gay men could become HIV positive if we don't do something. How can we even let that roll across our tongues if we don't do something? Is that an option? If so, why is it? How can we be in a time of major cities throughout this country announcing significant decreases in new HIV diagnosis and reaching the UN AIDS 90-90-90 goals and at the same time watch the numbers increase among gay Latinos? How can we rejoice about the diagnosis about black women are decreasing but yet look at the awful, embarrassing mortality rates among them? And I want to be really clear, when I say we, I mean we. I, I, I help lead this thing. It really is about all of us really pushing ourselves. How can we even entertain the realities of the disparities that exist across the southern United States, as Dr. Merman pointed out? I don't mean to be preachy here, at least not for preachy's sake. Rather, I'm attempting to underscore the important point in this conversation. We're amazingly close to achieving the easy part of eradicating AIDS and stemming HIV as public health threats. Our remaining work will be a massive undertaking. It will require a boldness, an introspection, a willingness to change course when needed. It means addressing the racist, misogynist, trans, and homophobic systems that fostered this tragedy from the beginning. And it may even mean giving up some resources. It means turning to people like you for new teaching, new thinking, and new ways of doing. I stole some of Gary's time. He told me I could have it. <laughs> there is great hope. I've been thinking about AIDS over. There is great hope. I've been thinking about AIDS a lot over the past couple of weeks. One of the amazing things I get to do in my work is to make connections and seek opportunities for our company to support important work in the community. A while back, Cleve Jones, and if you don't know who he is, I'll tell you to search him asked me to dinner in San Francisco. And once you know who he is, you'll know that when Cleve Jones asks you to go to dinner, you just say, yes, Cleve Jones. Turns out he wanted to gauge the possibility of our supporting the return of the AIDS Memorial Quilt to San Francisco and its long-term preservation. I rarely step out in front of my boss or the company, but I immediately ensured him that we were interested. It was a long 18-month process that necessitated the involvement of Speaker Pelosi and Congressman Lewis's offices. But 12 days ago, under the beautiful vaulted ceilings of the Great Hall of the Library of Congress, we sat as the official transfer of the quilt was announced. It had been a while since I'd been surrounded by the panels of that quilt. It can be overwhelming. As it always does, the speaker's voice broke as the ache once again freshly renewed when she pointed to the panel that memorializes a woman who had been the flower girl in her wedding. The Librarian of Congress paused as she recalled her cousin who died from complications due to AIDS. My own heart felt ripped open again as I thought of the last time the quilt was on full display on the Capitol Mall and my friends literally peeled me off one of the panels of the more 30 than 35 people I've lost to AIDS. It's painful to go back there to that time, but it's useful to be reminded that the heartache and the grief, but also how very far we've come, thanks to activism, advocacy, working with and against systems, understanding where the cogs get stuck, and what it takes to get them moving. The question posed is, can we eradicate AIDS? I think the answer is an unequivocal yes. My question back to us, will we?
Thank you, John. We move on to Dr. Helen Ailes. She is a professor of infectious diseases and international health, the director of the research Sambart project, London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Helen is a reader in the clinical research unit of the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, and for the last 11 years, has been the director of the research at Sambart, and she is based full time in Lusaka, Zambia. She has significant body of work, including HIV testing and uh, improving, improving health, dealing with comorbidities, including tuberculosis, and also to look at health systems and how to improve them. We're very privileged today to have Dr. Helen Ailes. And I did tell her I love her shoes. <laughs> so good afternoon, everybody, and thank you very much for inviting me to speak. And I'm going to really agree, I think, a lot with the previous speakers. And I'm really talking about eliminating HIV um, as a public health emergency. And I, I would want to agree with everybody else that do we have the tools? Yes, I think we do. But will we do it? And will we do it in the time frame that we've set ourselves by 2030? And I'm afraid we won't. And I want to build my talk today just around five Ps because sometimes I think it helps me to remember and might, may help you to remember what I think um, I'm talking about. Those five Ps are prejudice, poverty, and power, which I think are continuing this epidemic. And I think the hope is if we prioritize prevention and prioritize people. And so I'd like to um, tell you about those things. So starting about prejudice, we already, we all know that HIV is the most stigmatized condition that, uh, that, that we know. And it predominantly affects populations who are marginalized and criminalized. The map you see there shows um, countries according to the laws that they have about sexual orientation. Those countries marked in blue have laws that protect populations. And those countries in sort of the yellow going through to the brown are countries where um, sexual um, orientation, um, people's identity is criminalized. The countries in the darkest brown have the death penalty. Even the country where I'm from, Zambia, in the last week, two men were jailed for 15 years for engaging in homosexual sex. If this continues, we will never eliminate HIV. HIV itself is criminalized. The figure at the bottom from the Advancing HIV Justice Report shows the number of cases brought between 2015 and 2018 um, for spreading HIV. And some of the countries where most cases have been brought may not surprise you, countries where we know there is discrimination and criminalization. But I think the fact that the United States, Canada, the UK, and France are in that list is shameful. Two of the key populations that we've talked about, those individuals um, who inject drugs and female sex workers, are some of populations who face criminalization um, and abuse. A, a review with mathematical modeling um, published in The Lancet in 2015, found that purely by decriminalizing sex work, we could prevent up to 46% of new HIV infections in sex workers, and yet we don't do it. And of course, worldwide, the population most affected by HIV are poor people of color, wh whether they're in Africa or here in the United States. So I want to talk about poverty. I do believe that unless we eliminate poverty or the structural determinants that go along with poverty, we will not um, eliminate HIV. Poverty affects every aspect of people's lives. These are two of the communities where I work, um, one in South Africa and one in Zambia, where, pop where young women um, faced with the poverty are forced into unsafe choices, 
they're forced into transactional sex, into early marriage. They don't have um, opportunities that the rest of us may, may have. But, it do, but poverty doesn't just affect women and girls. This study with the figure is um, from Gibbs in uh, South Africa, looked at the effects of poverty and the violence that go along with that on young men. They found that 20% um, of, of men in these populations had experienced the death, the violent death, of a member of their family or a close friend, and a third had witnessed an armed um, attack. They found that the trauma of these experiences alongside poverty um, demonstrated by food insecurity led to substance abuse, depression, and to risky sexual choices, including transactional sex, condomless sex, and having multiple sexual partners. In Africa, men are less likely to test for HIV and less likely to engage in services. And most often the reason put forward is because of livelihood choices. Many men are not engaged in formal employment, but rely on informal employment, piecework, petty trading, and the conflict of, of earning money with receiving services, um, the money wins out. And what about power? I, as a researcher, would like to believe that the research I do, the evidence I produce, influences policy. But one of the courses I took early on in my public health career, which was called Health Policy, Process and Power, taught me that that's not the case. Policy is not always based on science and evidence, but rather it's based on who has the power. It's about powerful personalities and political realities, and of course, more than anything, it's about money. These are the global resources being put into HIV, and you can see that they are flatlining. The yellow bars there are domestic resources, which thankfully are going up. The orange is money from the US government in its PEPFAR program, and the pale green um, the Global Fund, and these two together have been, have funded much of the work uh, around the world fighting HIV. The PEPFAR program has been unprecedented, and I think it's turned the tide on HIV in many, many countries. But I think we have reached a very important point in the epidemic, where we have the choice to go forwards or we have the choice to fall back. Jonathan mentioned a big study that I was privileged to be one of the leaders of, um, Pop Art, where we were looking at universal test and treat. And the graph over there shows the effect of reducing HIV incidence, and so the number of HIV cases averted, this is a modeling graph, and the purple line shows how many cases were averted. But what would happen if that program stopped? The purple line falls down. It has to be continued, that's the green line, for us to continue averting cases. And what we're seeing right now in many of these countries is that the foot is being taken off the accelerator. Instead of focusing on increasing testing, increasing access, the, the trend is to decrease, the trend is to focus, to target, and I believe that we will fail if we do this. We will not reach the people who, we're, who we are missing right now. Um, and so I think the power and the policy need to change right now for us to make a difference. And what can make a difference? I think prioritizing prevention is vital at this point. This diagram shows four sort of key pillars of prevention. Condom use, these have been talked about. Um, scaling up treatment as prevention, and I agree, 1990-90 is nowhere near enough. We've got to get close to 100. And also PrEP. We also need to focus on um, male circumcision and on um, harm reduction services and opiates um, and substance um, uh, uh, treatment programs. But when we look at the UNAIDS model, by 2020, our aim was to get to 500,000 infections. And the model assumed um, that we would cover 90% of key populations, and we would um, cover 90% of adolescent girls and young women, we would distribute condoms, etc. But what did we really achieve? We failed to reach key populations. We failed to reach adolescent girls and young women. We distributed a pitiful amount of condoms. 
and PrEP use really didn't go up anywhere near what was needed. So it's no wonder that we are not reaching our targets. But I do believe that if we do focus on prevention and we prioritise prevention, we could reach those targets. Globally, we're aiming to spend only 25% of our budget on prevention, and yet at the moment we reach about 11%. But finally, I think the possibilities are within people. I'm delighted that the UNAIDS um, slogan for this year's World AIDS Day is communities make the difference. We know that communities are the people who can reach. We know that communities can innovate. We know that communities can uphold human rights. And we know that communities are part of our health solution. So these are two of my community lay workers who look after the people in their community providing services for HIV tirelessly. So can we do it? I think we can. Will we do it? I think is still under debate. Thank you. Thank you so much. And our next panelist is Gary Daffin. Gary is the executive director of the Multicultural AIDS Coalition and for almost a decade. Um, he, is, he lives in Massachusetts, but is a native of Mobile, Alabama. And all his work is centered on activism. And he has worked in the greater Boston area, representing and focusing on people who are living with HIV, gay, bisexual men, people who inject drugs, immigrants, transgender individuals, women and men who are engaged in transactional sex. He is part, I think, of every organization community, national, boards, hospitals, including Fenway, in terms of really moving the agenda towards representing people who have HIV and AIDS. He has received numerous awards. I'm not going to point them all out, but I think you can see from his work that he has really been a big, big mover of HIV and AIDS programs within Massachusetts. Gary. Thank you. Um, thanks for having me out here today. Um, I did, in fact, give Douglas some of my time, so I'm going to be as brief as possible. Um, so I decided I'll just pull out a few things that I wrote in here. Um, and I have to say, thinking about this was actually very difficult to do. Um, and I kept trying to figure out why. Um, I wrote stuff, and I kept saying, this is not really what I want to say. Um, and I guess, basically, when it, the discussions that we have about ending, ending the epidemic um, are hard because I feel like there's something that, as someone who's lived, who's been a gay man living through the epidemic for the past 40 years, a, a, a man who's not living with HIV, um, HIV has become such a part of our DNA that we don't really think that it could possibly end. Um, and so I thought back about how I've been, I was very involved in the, um, LGBT rights. And we never thought that gay marriage would actually happen. And even though I was a kid, I always thought I would marry a man. It, I always thought I would marry a man. I, would still, I still never thought it would happen until the opportunity for it to happen came. And we took it. And hell froze over. And we got gay marriage. <laughs> but the difference with this is that it dawned on me that to the public, that was really a white thing and HIV has become a black and brown thing. And so I think there's a difference. So one of the issues that kept coming to me is like, do we have the urgency and the political will to make this happen, uh, to, to support the effort? Um, and what, what the general public sees, I think, is that, you know, we see the commercials of people who live with HIV who are happy and healthy, with people who are taking PrEP are happy and healthy. Um, so for a lot of people in America, HIV has already been eradicated. AIDS has been eradicated. It doesn't really exist. And so part of the struggle is that we still got to do all that hard work to get to the point where the opportunity to end it comes and we can take it. And I don't think we're, I don't think we're there yet, um, but we have to envision it to be able to get there. But there's all that hard work to, to do still to get there. Um, and let's see, I'll fast forward to 
The other thing that came to my mind is that this isn't, we have an aging population in HIV work, um, and most people living with HIV are now over 50, um, and a lot of people who are in the field are over 50 or approaching 50. Um, and it, I thought about the fact that when we were young, HIV was much more urgent. Um, it was something that was, we were afraid of it, our friends were dying, um, and it was people who lived with HIV who were driving a lot of the work, but people who were negative were also very much engaged and very much a part of, um, how do you say, HIV was very much present in their world, in their life, in their actual sex life, and everything they did. And, the, and so it was this really strong, urgent call to do something about this. So we were moving government, we were talking to our friends, we were raising money, um, everybody was involved. Um, and now, I think as the, there are lots of young people who are involved in HIV now. Um, I think there's a lot less, less, a lot of great work, um, a lot of passion, um, but that sense of urgency is perhaps not as strong as it used to be. And even among the older people, like me, I'm 56, HIV has a wholly different presence in my life. And I realized as I was writing this, is that I don't actually get up and go to work every day anymore because of HIV. It's the, all those things that make people at risk for HIV, which is what I did before I got into HIV. And now, you know, we have the tools to keep people well. We have the tools to prevent HIV. But if we don't work on the things that people put people at risk, and we talk about, you know, disparities, um, homelessness, poverty, those are things that, that's what's happening. Um, people who are marginalized, transgender folks, gay and lesbian folks, if we don't work on making sure that stigma and people feel worthy and people feel like they deserve to have a life, um, we're not going to end this epidemic. Um, and I think even for gay men who are in their 50s, um, I think that sense of urgency has also receded a little bit. And so we've got to figure out how is it that we can energize the entire community to get us to that point where we have the opportunity to end the HIV epidemic. Um, so I, that's, that's part of why it's, it was a little bit difficult for me to kind of imagine what to say. I mean, I knew all of the things that people have said would be said. Um, and if you asked me to talk about how we would get there, I could do that. But my gut, um, it made me feel like, what do we really mean by this? And how are we going to get there? And what is it that's really missing here? Um, and so I think it's really about how do we mobilize and uh, unify black and brown folks in particular, gay people in particular, to move us to the point where we have that opportunity. Um, and I don't know when we'll get there. I think we can get there in my lifetime because my people live a long time. I'll be here for another 50 years. But <laughs> hopefully it'll be faster than that. But I think we need to really figure out how do we re-engage folks? How do we sort of create that sense of urgency um, and the political will to do it. Because the political will means that we have to convince folks that these, that black and brown, poor people, gay people, transgender people are worth our expending effort and money to make sure that we get to that point. Um, and that's really the challenge. I mean, it can be done. But if we don't make sure that the broader community understands that these folks' lives are worth saving, we're never going to get there. I think that's all I have to say. Thank you to all the panelists. And may I, may I invite all the panelists to occupy the chairs at the uh, front of the podium. And uh, we're now open for question and answers for our panelists. Yes, yeah. yes. <laughs> so thank you all very much for being here. I, I appreciate um, all of the work that all of you are doing and the presentations that you've all given. But I, I want to start with the place that Gary and Douglas stopped and this issue of who do you engage and in what way do you engage? And in what way is it important then for us to raise that sense of urgency 
because I, I don't know, and like all of you have been involved in this work for a long time, but that issue of urgency and then thinking about who do you engage in in what way. And I'm wondering if you actually have an answer to the question that you've actually posed. Maybe. <laughs> um, well, I think that it goes without saying that you can't engage people that are at that are the most vulnerable unless you um, have people from those communities doing the work. Um, and we are, right now we're engaged in this mobilization effort um, that involves people from around the country to sort of look at um, HIV in black communities with respect to ending the epidemic, um, an effort that Douglas has supported very generously. Um, and we had our first planning meeting and we came out, we ended up with a bunch of questions to do this survey with the, with the community, but the, the framing question became, what would it look like if the response to HIV was run by black people? Um, and it's going to be a very interesting, we're getting some very interesting response from around the community. Mostly, you know, people would think like, oh, everything would be great, but not necessarily, because we have all those other things. Um, but we do need to figure out who needs to be at the table and not just the usual suspects. I think now we're at the point where, oddly, we're going back to the beginning. We're asking the same questions we did early on. Like, who needs to be at the table? How do we motivate black businesses and black institutions to be engaged? Um, because it's a different epidemic now. It's a different point in the epidemic. And so we can't assume that we're at a certain place. Um, we need to sort of rethink and reframe, like, what does it take now based on where we are and what people's experience over the past 25, 30 years has been, including black folks, who I work with particularly. Um, and so we have to rethink what that is. We don't know the answer to that question yet. And it's partly what, we're, what we need to do more of is, is talk to folks and figure out what will help us engender that sense of urgency now, if that makes sense. And I gave the microphone to him because I was pretty sure I knew what he was going to say. And I, while I agree, I'm, I'm thinking of the often quoted, often misquoted, and often overused uh, African adage, um, in particular South Africa, nothing about us without us. I do think it requires um, black and brown people to be at the table, to be in leadership positions, but I in no way want to suggest, um, hint, or send any kind of message that we don't need all of our allies and everyone to be at the table to help us achieve what we have to achieve. There are many brilliant minds, and uh, Dr. Merman talked about this in, in his talk at this very university where there's so much going on in various spaces around innovation and artificial science and artificial uh, intelligence, et cetera, uh, to, uh, we need everyone to be energized. And so I think part of our work as leaders is to do the work that inspires people, that engages people, uh, that when necessary challenges people. Uh, but it is the, the who I think is all of us, those who will, those who will care, those who will understand uh, the importance of human dignity and human rights for each of our sisters and brothers and those who identify elsewise uh, on the face of the earth. I just wanted to add that um, I think where I come from, the generation that's highly at risk now is the adolescent girls and young women and um, the men as well. Um, but I think for the younger generation, they didn't see the devastation that happened in the 90s. I'm not that old, but I'm old enough to remember what it was like back then and having you know, friends or relatives uh, be sick and not have any access to any treatment. And now, um, I think it was Gary who said you have all these adverts on TV where you know, people with HIV are healthy, happy, and that's what it looks like, and so then, it's hard to sell the message of prevention because I think uh, lo a lot more needs to be done um, on prevention and push the needle on the different uh, prevention strategies that are there. And if everybody perceives HIV to be you know, this 
disease that doesn't mean anything and you can go on and live these happy, healthy lives, then um, they don't take that prevention message very seriously. So I think really engaging with um, individuals most at risk within your population and understanding what puts them at risk and trying to bring them to the table to have those conversations um, to be able to put in strategies that you know, change whatever area you want to, uh, to change. Any other questions for the panel, please? Well, thank you very much for the talk. Um, I was struck by uh, Dr. Sikazwe's comments from CIDES, where she mentioned that the healthcare workers, um, the perception is that healthcare workers are an impediment to patients coming in. And uh, we're seeing work coming out of South Africa that's showing the same thing amongst adolescent um, uh, student goers student who their biggest uh, issue is the fact that healthcare workers are not welcoming. And I wondered, um, as the panel thinks about the expansion of services in areas where healthcare workers are limited, the likelihood is that healthcare workers are going to be even more overburdened in the future. Um, and so whether they had thoughts around how that's going to be addressed and also um, ways in which we can address um, healthcare workers' perceptions about social norms around sex and key populations. Thank you. Um, that's a very good question and one that we're struggling with right now. So based off that work that we did, uh, we realized that we had to um, work with um, different stakeholders, so including policymakers, healthcare providers, and clients themselves to try and figure out how do we provide more patient-centered care. So we had a series of co-creation workshops where we called our frontline healthcare workers and uh, district policymakers, as well as those from um, uh, high up in the Ministry of Health. And one of the things that came out really early during the co-creation workshop was that you're looking at um, providing patient-centered care. You should be talking about provider-centered care because we're the ones that are in the facilities that you know, get verbally and sometimes physically abused by these uh, patients, uh, but they don't understand that I'm living and working in the same environment that they're in that's poverty-stricken, no access to the different modalities that I need to be able to provide them with quality care. I'm overworked, I see hundreds of patients, so how then do you change that environment for me so that I can provide them with the care that they need? So some of the work that we're, we're, we're doing is just around uh, behavioral change and how to manage your, your, um, your environment and um, the stress that you're dealing with. How do you change the workflow, the patient flow, so that it's not um, too stressful? How can you lean on other providers that you're working with in the facility to take off some of your load? as well as um, uh, engaging with patients to get a sense of what that experience was at the facility and using that feedback to then sit down with uh, providers and uh, comparing that feedback with actual patient outcomes like viral load suppression, uh, retention, and uh, wait times within the clinic. So it's really cross-cutting and using different um, indicators to try and change the experience for both the patient and the provider. And just adding on to that, I mean, I think other things which also goes back to the, to the last point is that if you ask your community what they want and what services they want and how they want those to be provided, and particularly thinking about prevention, and particularly for young people, we, um, we've engaged with uh, a lot of young people, ask them what they really want, and they say we don't want to go to the facilities, we don't want any of the prevention care, which doesn't need to be done by the health service into the health service, which is already overstretched and they're horrible and rude and all the rest of the things that have come out. Um, and so we want it somewhere other than that. And so that's what we're implementing right now with, you know, services, particularly prevention services, and not just prevention for HIV, prevention of pregnancy, prevention of all other diseases, um, you know, safe water, various things. But putting prevention as something that's outside of the health system uh, in the community health system, which is where it much better fits. And so I think using what communities and what people say, what they want, and the, the power that they have to implement some of those things, again, will get us away from, uh, you know, reduce the, the burden on the healthcare workers. I think it's very interesting. I think your work, 
you know, um, years ago, actually, we did some video work with healthcare providers and with clients, and, and we um, asked the clients to act out an encounter, and they acted out with the healthcare providers being really, really rude and really nasty to, to, the, to the patients. And we asked the providers to act it out, and we thought it would be different, and it was exactly the same. They also acted out being really rude to the patient. So it's not that people don't realise that they're doing it, but the situation they're in forces, forces them into it. Yes, I, I want to thank all of the panelists for your contributions, for your presentation today. My question is uh, somewhat related to an earlier one. Uh, the, the presentation on uh, care, uh, I don't remember exactly the, the title, but caring for each other rudely underscores for me the importance of cultural competence. And so the question is, how do we um, foster cultural competence and ask the hard questions when the community norms are in opposition. Does that make sense? Well, it's a very difficult one and uh, one that we're struggling with. Um, I don't think I have an answer for you and perhaps through the work that we're currently doing, uh, maybe I will get closer to understanding how to, how to do that. But what we're doing right now is really trying to um, listen to what the providers are telling us, and then uh, trying to work with their management systems, um, their supervisors, to try and see what we can do to be able to uh, provide them with the necessary support. And I think it's also been helpful for them to get the actual feedback from their clients in terms of how they perceive um, that relationship and uh, what changes the clients are looking for. Um, Again, it's something that we're struggling with and I don't have the answer for you. Do the domestic perspective differ from the international perspective? <laughs> okay, I, I, I talked a lot earlier. So, <laughs> so I'm trying. You're still you know, alive. <laughs> I, 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 am, you know, I think this, so first, the, the average time a physician in the United States spends with a patient is seven minutes and that's all they're allowed. And when I was practicing, it was 15 minutes, and before me, it was longer. And so, so I think what, what it is is that the, 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 there's a, uh, the systems are changing in ways that are harmful to the interactions and to the support of the people who are trying to serve. Um, I think in response to the last two questions, what we do in, in our, you know, whether we're um, academics or uh, care providers or um, in public health, is we immediately think, well, okay, we've, we have to think about tools. We have to think about training materials. We have to think, how can we help um, in the medical schools getting people to ask sexual histories? How do we have, got, you know, how do we start changing the environment at its base and to try to make sure that, that people have um, anti-racism workshops and other things that will, will change that environment? And I think that can help. But many of the same issues that plague us still exist at almost the same force that they have for the past 50, 100, or 500 years. So I'm intrigued by the question of what kind of goals we could put into place, what kind of um, measures and indicators we could monitor that would make it so that the systems want to change. So if people are falling out of care because people are being rude to them, because it's hard to get there, because it's not an environment that is embracing me as a person. What if I made falling out of care a demerit? And you get rewards for very high levels of viral suppression in your patients. And if someone leaves, you can't just take them off your patient roles. They actually have, they stay in the measure of success. Because that's what we do in public health. We don't just care about the numerator, right? We care about the denominator as well. And, I, I mean, and I've been thinking, so what would that entail? And maybe if we start doing that more, we would start seeing people wanting to change, wanting the structures to change, because they will need to if they're going to survive, instead of what's happening now, which is there's an economic and a social structure that's going in the opposite direction. So um, what we see is that our Ryan White clients, people living with HIV, they we have very high levels of our suppression. People like their doctors. On the prevention side is where the problem is. Um, people will go in and ask for PrEP and either the person doesn't know what it is, which is ridiculous in Boston, or I had one client, friend actually, said he walked in and asked about PrEP and she said, what's the problem? You can't use condoms? 
and I said, I hope you fired her, which you did. And which is actually something we do with our clients a lot, is we tell people, you know you can fire your doctor. Particularly young people don't know that, they think they have the doctor and that's it, that they, they can't move. And when they find out that if they don't want to talk to their doctor, they can go somewhere else and we can help them go somewhere else, that's a big deal uh, for them. And it sort of gives them a sense of, of, of agency. Um, it may take them a while to get to talk to the doctors about sex though. So part of the cultural change is getting the clients and the doctors obviously to talk about, to talk about sex. Um, we do trainings with folks and a lot of people are just afraid. They don't know how to, even a lot of doctors have never learned how to talk about sex. Um, and we ask, we try to get our clients to be activists for themselves and sort of advocate for themselves and teach them how to like go and talk about sex, go and talk about the fact that you had anal sex, say the words anal sex, you know, don't beat around the bush, um, so to speak. So to speak. Um, <laughs> 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 and it's a big deal. I mean, it's uh, particularly in certain communities, particularly in communities of color, people don't want to talk about sex and sexuality. And that's a big hurdle that we have to get over. And doctors, well, no, I mean, there were studies that out a couple years ago that showed that even black physicians were less likely to ask their, their black clients about HIV because they were afraid of stigmatizing them, which is the most ridiculous logic in the world, but I, I sort of know where they're coming from. But they need to ask them about it, everybody, no matter who. Um, and it's different in, you know, obviously it's different in resource-rich places like Boston. I mean, it's easy to like, Fire your doctor, walk across the street, and get a new doctor. We'll just take you. Uh, as opposed to, you know, in Alabama where I am, it's a much different ball game. Um, and but still, getting getting people to be able to advocate for themselves and know that they can is a big is a big deal. Any yes, please. So I wanted to to ask about something that Dr. Ailes brought up about involving the community, because I think that the way we're really going to do prevention is by involving the community. And I mean, the community is really small. I mean, all politics is local. Well, so does all public health. And, and the only thing that I've seen that works is, is identifying a champion. Uh, just training people from the outside to go in doesn't help. You have to identify a champion. I'm just wondering have, if you or anyone has any advice for us about how we can identify and support those champions because it's not an easy ask and it's not scalable I, as far as I can tell. It doesn't seem like something you could just put out a policy and say, okay, great, now we'll do this. This is how we're going to identify who the champions are going to be. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree. I, I think, but again, I think it comes from within the community, as you say. What the experience we had when we were doing um, pop art was that we were trying to engage whole communities. And these were big communities, big urban communities with very limited sort of social structure. They weren't like rural places with a chief and a headman and what have you. Big, messy urban communities. But what we found was, you know, the first year, maybe even the second year, you know, it was tough, tough going. By the time we got into the third and then the fourth year, we really started to see a change in the communities because we were going to every single person in those communities and trying to engage every single person in discussions about HIV and trying to get everybody to test and trying to get everybody to treatment and prevention. And so the, the whole discussion and the whole process uh, in the communities started to change, but it took time. And out of that change came champions who chose themselves and their community chose them. It wasn't that we could have gone in, as you say, we couldn't you know, go in and say, this person, this is what we're gonna do and this is how they're gonna lead this. It came from within the communities. But the challenge in public health and in epidemiology and measuring and any of these things is, how do you measure those fundamental changes at whole community level? Because that's what I believe um, is really going to be important and is gonna end, um, you know, the HIV epidemic as, as we know it is, is that fundamental change of thinking, getting everybody engaged, getting communities to engage and really, and that's what's also gonna push, I think, politicians and policy. But we've got to get there first. I think an opportunity sure. came in the Affordable Care Act uh, where uh, they placed uh, an emphasis on community health workers uh, who, whose work could be reimbursed, who could be paid, uh, but people who were from local communities to be trained to do that work. And 
while there's been some success in that, you know, as you look across uh, the country, we don't have it in a large scale. And I actually think it's a real opportunity for public, private, academic uh, models to develop, to see, and that in fact also demonstrate uh, outcomes that are favorable and then becomes a policy issue that one can, that can be uh, advocated. So uh, I do think, uh, and, and it's there, right? The model is there, we know what it is. And uh, I think if we could do some pilots around the country, uh, around the world, around the globe, uh, there, I think there, real, there could be a real opportunity there. So could, I absolutely agree with you. Yes, please. Thank you so much for all of your uh, remarks. I think there was a consensus agreement in terms of having the tools and the resources, but the one piece that you all sort of ended your remarks around were people, prejudice, political will, and a lot of that, I think, goes back to stigma. And in, I'll speak about Boston. So in terms of all of the at-risk populations that we're serving here in Boston and uh, done at the state, uh, these are already marginalized populations. So I wonder from your different vantage points what your thoughts were around stigma, particularly when, I think it was Gary, when the face of the epidemic has shifted. So I'm, I'm curious about strategies, things that might have worked, things that could come to scale in terms of dealing with stigma. Yeah, I think it's I think it's really tough in our situation. You know, we I think I maybe naively thought that as we rolled out treatment and as treatment became available and as you know, it, it, the stigma would would go down. And we really haven't seen that. You know, uh, uh, the stigma has changed, but but it's still there and it's still very pervasive. And I don't think we've got really very good interventions to really reduce that. Um, the only interventions that we've tried were interventions really with healthcare workers trying to reduce the stigma and the prejudice that they were, you know, putting onto their clients and, and patients. And and we did find some evidence that, you know, by more education and talking and thinking about these whole issues about how you deal with people, you could reduce a little bit of stigma there, but really we haven't got anywhere with the more gener gener generic stigma. John, you have something to say? Well, well, if not, I want to thank our speakers, our panelists, for a wonderful afternoon. And thank you for all your contributions and the audience for your great questions and challenging questions. I think we have a lot to think about. We learned a lot, but we will continually be challenged. Thank you. <laughs>